Good evening and welcome to the May 18th regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council. First item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance and I'd like to ask Council Member Sesma to lead us in the pledge. Everyone else mute themselves otherwise it's a jumbled mess and let's follow along with Mike. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, for tonight's reflection, um, I wanted to call everyone's attention to the uh, tragic passing of Carrie Dietz, Carrie McMahon Dietz, um, who was a distinguished member of our community, uh, lived in the Kentlands neighborhood, uh, contributed a lot both personally and professionally to making Gaithersburg the great city that it is, was involved in lots and lots of uh, city endeavors and, and partnered endeavors, and we are all going to miss her dearly. So if we can have a moment of silence, please. Thank you all very much. Um, next item on our agenda, we have uh, the first set of appointments, and this is to the Educational Enrichment Committee and the Environmental Affairs Committee. Uh, if someone wants to raise their hand to make a motion, please go right ahead. Let's go with Neil. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, re I make the motion that uh, we approve the resolution that you made to, for reappointments to the Educational Enrichment and Environmental Affairs Committees. Uh, for the Educational Enrichment Committee, Jason Wilcox for a two-year term expiring May 2022. And for the Environmental Affairs Committee, a two-year term for Doug Wolf expiring May of 2022. Ryan? Okay, I'll second that. Okay, we're going to call the roll then. We will start with Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Sesma? Aye. Council Member Sales? Aye. Council Member Wu? Aye. And Council Member Spiegel? Aye. Okay, that carries 5 0. Uh, we'll thank them when we see them, Jason and Doug. And next, we have another set of appointments this to the Board of Appeals. Uh, three, three appointments here. Who'd like to make a motion? Mike, please. Um, Mr. Mayor, I move a resolution uh, confirming your appointments to the Board of Appeals. Uh, these are all reappointments, uh, terms to expire in May 2023, Robert Chiswell, Aaron Kotak, and Emily Wong. Emil, I think that's Emil. I'm sorry, Emil Wong. Yeah. Okay, Lorianne. Second. Okay, so all those in favor say, say aye. Any opposed say nay. We will call the roll, starting with Councilmember Harris. Aye. Councilmember Sesma. Aye. Councilmember Sales. Aye. Councilmember Wu. Aye, but I think Emil Wang's address may be incorrect. Okay, well, we, yes. can, we can get that resolved. Uh, and then Councilmember Spiegel. Aye. It would, having the, it carries unanimously, um, and we'll just ask staff to correct the record for the address. Doris, is that okay? Okay. Okay, next item on our agenda is public comments tonight. We have two people signed up for public comments. And again, I'll remind everybody else who's watching uh, that we are glad to, you, you can sign up to do public comments during our Zoom meetings, or you can submit comments in writing and they'll be considered just the same. Um, our first commenter, tech team could bring up Brother Geronimo Flansbaum. Okay, I'm unmuted, is that right? Yes, you are on, go right ahead. Wonderful, Mayor, Council, this is Geronimo Flansbaum and I'm here to announce my candidacy for the November 2021 mayoral campaign. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I have a lot of support for the current mayor and for all of you. And uh, I hope that uh, I can learn from you as time goes on here between now and the year from November. Uh, I'd like to attend more of these meetings, learn how it's done 
And um, I think together, may the best man win, or war woman, I should say. And I really uh, am happy to be a member of this community. And thank you for listening. I'm done. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and we will look forward to um, hearing from Geronimo and, and uh, seeing how this, this plays out over the next year and a half. Um, next, I'd like to call the, ask the tech team to call up Dave Anderson. And Dave, once you uh, get in and unmute yourself, um, just state your name so we can understand that we've heard that you're on and we just go right ahead and start. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Uh, I'm Dave Anderson. And I live at Whetstone Run. I'd like to comment on the bias uh, against the east side of Gaithersburg that the mayor and city council has displayed over the past year. Contrary to statements made earlier, there is indeed a bias as I reason as follows. First, the council is or was considering the closing of Via Ridge polling station and moving it to town center. This would make it more difficult for local residents to vote. Second, the council is or was considering the elimination of all writing cabinets. Due to the nature of political issues, the city council and mayor can construct any justification they need for these actions. The local residents believe that the changes were being considered because of the campaign to save Kelly Park. Third, looking at your proposed budget, park improvements all on the west side of Gaithersburg. Contrast that with the vote to remove the only multi-use park on the east side. Given your voting record, have, have you informed west side residents that what you're really doing in this budget is improving land for future Board of Education use? House purchase decisions and therefore property values are made with parks in mind. You should at least be honest with the west side residents and warn them of future uh, Board of Education takes overs of their parks for schools done without input or consent and your acquiescence in those takeovers. Fourth, we on the east side have also observed that the mayor and all but one of the city council members live on the west side of Gaithersburg. The four council members who voted for the school in Kelly Park did not live in the area, whereas the one who lives in the east side voted against it. Hilly, no biased, sounds like not in my backyard. I can understand improving new areas of the city, and I understand that, everybody would, but not at the expense of residents that have had money invested for improvements in their parks, who have purchased homes near those parks and want to keep those parks and build schools in other, more suitable locations for the school and keep the park. What you think and say will not really matter. It's what your actions say. And in the end, it will be up to the voters in the next two elections to judge your actions. Currently, what I'm doing is reviewing the budget. I don't see where you have budgeted for some modifications that's going to be required at the Kelly Park School, like sewer lines and the like. So, that will be my next discussion next time. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Councilman members. I appreciate the time. I just, I was muted. Um, thank you, Dave. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Um, and again, remind everybody that they're welcome to, to either participate in these meetings or send us stuff in writing. Um, we're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is from the mayor and council. We're going to start with council member Spiegel. Thank you, mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Not much to add tonight. Uh, just want to congratulate all the graduates from high school and college. Uh, I know there have been a lot of virtual celebrations over the last couple of days and uh, want to uh, offer uh, you know, my, my congratulations as well. Best wishes to them. I know it's a really challenging and difficult era and time to be trying to celebrate and move to the next steps in your lives. But uh, as many commencement speakers have virtually said over the last couple of days, uh, you know, I think that uh, this experience is only going to make you stronger. And uh, we need your ideas, your entrepreneurship, uh, your passion uh, for service to your community. 
uh, as uh, all of our communities, including Gaithersburg, rebuild uh, from this crisis. So just want to, again, wish all our graduates the best. Um, as I've previously reported, the Maryland Municipal League uh, continues to serve as a resource for cities and towns around the state. Uh, in my term this year as president of the statewide league, I'm working closely with mayors and council members and other municipal officials, as well as our incredible headquarters staff of MML to really adapt to the changing times and make sure that the value of the league is underscored as we advocate uh, to the state and to the federal governments uh, for additional aid that is really desperately needed for cities and towns in Maryland, large and small, uh, in all uh, geographic regions of the state. And we're continuing that advocacy and that collaboration uh, with uh, the General Assembly, with uh, the governor's administration, and with our federal uh, officials as well. Um, and we appreciate the city of Gaithersburg's uh, very robust support of the Municipal League and are looking forward to our first ever uh, virtual summer conference uh, in June. And then finally, uh, I'm sorry to jump the gun and I'm sure you'll have more to say about this, Mayor, but I just wanted to congratulate you and the entire team of staff and volunteers uh, who uh, had such a successful launch of the first virtual Gaithersburg Book Festival this past weekend. And I'll, I'll leave it to you to say more about that, but I was very proud of the city um, and very impressed with what was pulled together. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate that. Did you have more comments or you're done? That's it. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll go to Council Member Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll just echo Ryan's comments and whatever good things my colleagues say that uh, come next but not the bad things. Fair enough. I, I'll be curious how Doris reflects that in the, in the minutes. Um, Council Vice President Sales. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. So um, it's been a busy couple of weeks um, with the National League of Cities and their uh, advocacy efforts on the Hill trying to um, negotiate more resources for um, local municipalities um, in the next and most likely uh, final allocation for this session. And so um, we've been on calls weekly and disseminating information to our local municipalities, working with our state leagues. Um, and so we're hoping we will uh, hear some good news soon. Um, I know that we're one of the uh, bigger municipalities in Montgomery County. And so working with our colleagues across the county has been really important. And um, we've just been vigilant and hope that uh, our county and state leaders see the sacrifices that we're making at the local level and all the work that we're doing and the resources that we're expending in this time. And we just don't want to be left out um, when we are. Um, trying to restore and uh, revitalize the community as we uh, prepare to reopen in Montgomery County. Uh, so over the last two weeks, I um, also participated in the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. Uh, we're coming up on our final meeting of the year, but we had a paper competition going and I'm really proud that uh, fellow University of Maryland uh, student, Haley Clark, was uh, the winner of the paper competition. And I'm really proud of the topic that she um, chose. She's looking at, um, she proposed a new approach to preserving agriculture in the Washington metropolitan area. Um, and this was the first, she's the first winner of our paper competition for the Chesapeake Bay and Water Policy Committee. Um, and as we um, look at our food process and food production and the lack of food resources, local food production, um, it was a really um, important topic that I think we'll be looking more into as we respond to food recovery issues and insecurity issues um, throughout the country. And so I think it's timely research and look forward to seeing what comes of her and other research in this area. Um, 
congratulations to the mayor for his uh, first virtual book fest. I'm sure he'll share more comments about it. And um, I know that the mayor already mentioned the Dietz family laws. I also want to mention the laws of uh, trailblazer in the county, uh, Miss Odessa Shannon. She was the first African American on the Montgomery County Public School Board and the former director of the county's Office of Human Rights um, and um, worked for um, county executives. She was the special assistant to um, our former county executive. Um, and so we just wanna remember her and her contributions to the community and celebrate um, her life and um, reminding uh, everyone to stay home and stay safe and continue to social distance until we get word from our county about how things are going to reopen here in Montgomery County. Thank you. Thank you, Lorianne. I appreciate that tribute too. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we'll go to council member Sesma. Thank you, uh, mayor. And uh, thank you colleagues for your remarks so far. Um, also wanted to offer my condolences to the McMahon and Deeds families. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Carrie as, when she was the executive director for the Kentlands Community Foundation. Uh, and also got to know her when she was a, a writer for the, uh, the Town Courier. Uh, uh, a tremendous contribution to the community. And uh, I, I, uh, we, uh, we bonded somewhat because uh, our, we both had daughters named Elena and uh, I want to express uh, uh, sincere condolences to her two daughters and uh, her family, her family in Minnesota as well. So big loss for all of us. Um, I'll uh, cover a couple of things uh, at the Kentlands Community Foundation that happened recently. And these are things that the city has been involved in. So they are somewhat important or we've supported to some extent. Uh, June is usually uh, when uh, Kentlands Under the Lights um, convenes in uh, uh, Market Square. Uh, this year it's not possible to do that. Um, so I think uh, the committee is looking at ways to uh, uh, to continue that celebration in a, in a different way virtually as well. Uh, Music of Viva has become, uh, would, would have been the third year for Music of Viva, the outdoor classical music concert. Uh, that is probably going to be uh, virtual as well. So as the Community Foundation looks at some of the other activities uh, that uh, uh, the foundation works with the city on and, and serves the public, uh, there'll be other announcements uh, coming, coming up. Uh, the next one will be uh, talking about uh, what will happen with the 5K and that happens over Labor Day weekend. Um, and then uh, one of the things I wanted to, to uh, bring up and raise to the council uh, is recently um, uh, the county and the city of Rockville have either introduced or passed ordinances to uh, to address the potential uh, or to mitigate against uh, significant rent increases on the part of uh, landlords of uh, multifamily uh, properties throughout the county and in the city of Rockville. Uh, this would be a temporary measure that would that would extend for a brief period of time until after the emergency ended. Uh, I think the county's already passed theirs, uh, and uh, the city of Rockville, I believe, introduced theirs last week. So I think it's uh, it's appropriate for the city to possibly consider whether we need to do something similar uh, in uh, in the city of Gaithersburg given the high density of multifamily units we have and market rate units. I don't know that it's a problem yet, but I think we'll, we'll, we, I would like to ask staff to do some research on that, tell us what might be going on and uh, whether legislation might be appropriate to introduce. Um, I think uh, by and large, most landlords are, are being uh, very thoughtful and considerate in uh, dealing with uh, uh, not only uh, Rent, uh, delinquencies on, on uh, payment of rent, but also in terms of looking at, at increases and, and holding those down given the, the circumstances that many are facing, especially those families that live in uh, multifamily garden style apartments, et cetera. So um, 
I'd like to, I, I don't, I hope that there's support from the rest of the council to have, have staff undertake this, uh, this effort and perhaps we could hear from staff. Mike, they... Can we, uh, let, let me try to do this yeah. fairly quickly. Council members, if you're okay with having staff um, take a look and report back to us at our next meeting, uh, their findings or, or over email if they get it before, just raise your hand. I'm, I'm certainly okay with them. Their findings for? The, the evidence of an of, of a issue with uh, rent increases during this uh, crisis. Okay. Did that, would that cover it, Mike? Yeah, I think really it's whether or not we should we should uh, follow what uh, the county is doing. Example of the county and city of Rockville. I don't know whether other municipalities have this uh, power. So, uh, but I I don't think you know one of the things that happens often in the city of Gaithersburg is when the county passes something, many people think it applies within the city, and in this case, it wouldn't. There is nothing now to control. Uh, uh, these types of increases. So uh, I think it would be useful to find out whether we we might need something like this as well. Okay. Well, there certainly was support. Um, right. we'll go to Rob. Well, I'll tell you what. Finish your comments, Mike. Yes. We'll go to Neil, and then we'll come back to this question because I want to give everybody a chance to make sure, it. Sure. Thank you. So, and and to follow on with what with Ryan's congratulations to all those students who are graduating from high school, and then we have a number of people who graduated from from college in the last uh, couple of weeks as well, uh, hoping to start their uh, the 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 first steps on their path to their next career. So I want to. Uh, give a shout out to those folks as well. They worked hard to get to to where to this point in their life. They deserve congratulations and recognition for their accomplishments, and they they deserve uh, all the best wishes that we can provide and uh, send their way for a, a hopeful and optimistic and productive future for all of them. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. We'll go to we'll go to Councilmember Harris, and then we'll come back to the question. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I would like to echo uh, several items first. The uh, congratulations to the group that pulled, the, pulled off the virtual book festival on short notice. I know it wasn't the way that everyone wanted to run the book festival, but under the circumstances, it was a great pivot to something that worked well for everyone. Um, to the high school grads, again, congratulations. I can relate a little bit. My high school senior year was disrupted by an 11-week-long teacher strike. Um, unlike you, we actually had to go to school with no teachers, which was as you would think. Um, but anyway, uh, it was uh, very disruptive to us and we managed to get through it and go on to our education. And I'm sure that all of you will as well. So uh, congratulations, good luck, and uh, looking forward to seeing what you make of yourselves in the road ahead. Um, want to make a suggestion over the weekend when the weather was warm my son went out on uh, with me on the muddy branch trail and we took a nice uh, several mile long hike uh, we hardly saw anybody while we were out there it was beautiful the birds were singing and uh, the trees were growing and it was really nice I know we've been out on some other trails including Great Seneca uh, the trails around Great Seneca Lake at uh, Seneca Creek State Park which has been very crowded in fact they had to turn people away sometimes so um, I encourage you to be out and about and get some fresh air and exercise, but try to find other places. And the Muddy Branch Trail in Gaithersburg is a great one. Uh, the, uh, we were out on the towpath a couple of weekends ago, and that was uh, not too crowded as well. So many places to get out and uh, get out of the house every once in a while. So, uh, and I wanted to end on talking about the COVID situation that we're in. There's been a pretty spirited discussion on nextdoor.com and I'm, I'm under exaggerating what, uh, as spirited as it is, and many people have different positions on what should be done and what's appropriate or not. But at the end of the day, I've looked at the latest numbers and the uh, incidence of new cases of uh, the COVID disease in Maryland have hit a peak and are not really declining at any great level. We're still near the top level at about 1,000 new cases statewide a day. Uh, and the the, the worst areas in the state are Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and Baltimore City in terms of being still at the peak. So it's important, to, it's really annoying to have to stay inside. Uh, it's very challenging to make a living. I know my wife's business is down by about a third. Uh, the government contract I'm working on is now just uh, 
we've been asked to have a budget cut and it's tough for everybody. I mean, at least we're still working, but it's tough. Um, but it's better than being sick and it's better than, certainly better than being dead. So we've got to push our way through this for another, however long it takes. Uh, and contrary to what some of the people are concerned about on next door, I don't believe that this is a case of people trying to take your rights away. We're just trying to keep everybody safe. So please go along with the program for as long as we have to, and we'll get through this. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, and I, I guess I'll let this, the conversation about the rent increases happen and then I'll make my comments. So we'll, we'll, we'll get this, this uh, sort of resolved. Um, so the first hand that I saw was Rob Wu's. Uh, Rob, what did you, you wanted to add to that conversation? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, and and uh, I raised my hand to support the conversation, but I just wanted to make sure that we walk away with this, with the staff getting the guidance that they need, um, because we've all talked to staff about this issue, I think. Um, and my, what I was under the impression is staff was looking for guidance on which way um, and in what form any such ordinance would be coming um, rather than just a research project. So I think they've done the research on who's doing what where, and they were looking for more uh, guidance tonight, but they can always come on and correct me. Mike. Well, so I, I think certainly we have the guidance and po potentially a template either from the county or the, uh, uh, or the city of Rockville, uh, in both in terms of uh, the period of time that this would be in effect, but also in the, the magnitude of the, uh, of the restrictions. So, uh, you know, I, I was also prepared to introduce if, if there was going to be enough support, but I don't know that we have that. So, and we don't have anything to introduce anyway, but I think uh, we need to, we need to start somewhere. I think the model from the county or the city of Rockville is a reasonable way to go. Lorianne. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and so the uh, staff sent around some, um, comparisons about what other jurisdictions are doing within uh, Montgomery County and um, outside of Montgomery County. They have a um, list from Howard County, Prince George's County. And so I know that we can expect at least the next three months to be uh, still in the midst of the pandemic. And then at least three months after, and I think most of the uh, language that's written now for other municipalities who are addressing this is, you know, a three month um, of no uh, increases. And then three months after the uh, pandemic um, ceases or um, comes to an end and we, uh, start to uh, regain normalcy and so that's putting us close to the end of the year and when I was speaking with staff I proposed that we at least um, do uh, no rental increases for the next three months and three months after the um, pandemic ends and so I know that's you know there's quite a few Rockville has said no increases through the summer um, and so I'm just curious to see what we can, I guess, guide our guide the staff to do or propose um, for consideration between us this evening. Thank you, Lorianne. Um, so obviously, uh, as comes up here all the time, I'll get to you in a sec, Neil. Um, as as it comes up all all the time, I don't have a vote here. However, um, I, do have, I do have opinions uh, about things like this. Um, I, am ex I can see, um, I see what's going on in the other jurisdictions, obviously. Um, but I, I'm ex I, I come into this debate sort of inclined uh, to be extremely reticent about asserting ourselves in uh in in the middle of what is a uh, private uh, contracts between two private entities a property owner and uh a lease you know lessee um 
so there's that. Um, I think that the, the, the time, it also bears uh, noting that that this time, I think the incentives for uh, a property owner are far more weighed, are far more weighed in favor of retaining uh, current tenants rather than um, evicting them or, or trying to, to uh, raise uh, rents at this point. Um, but I recognize there can be there can be a bad apple here and there. Um, and I, I'm also reticent to get involved in things that, that could sort of open a box to rent control uh, when there are, the world is rife with examples of very, very well-intentioned rent control situations that have gone badly wrong. Um, that said, you know, I, I sort of, I see there's, there's at least some momentum here. We're gonna go to Neil first and then, and then back to you, Lorianne. Um, I just want to be really careful um, about about how we approach this, and and if we're going to do something, I'd want to do it as as least intrusively as possible. Um, that's my my perspective. Let's go to Neil, and then we'll come back to Lorianne. All right, thanks, Mayor. Um, I have to say, everything I've heard so far about rents in the region is that landlords are giving people a break and not the other way around. So I would like to know not just what other jurisdictions are doing, but I'd like some hard evidence that there's an issue here that's really going on. I know my, my tenants and I have had conversations and I've given them uh, some leeway on the rents. My wife in her uh, business where she rents an office space uh, has gotten some leeway on her rents as well. And that's what I'm hearing all over. I know I've talked to at least several of you who are up here about, the, about your personal uh, experiences. So, Unless there's some reality that people are, that landlords are taking advantage of this in the wrong direction. I mean, I think all the economic pressure is, uh, is for lower rents and not higher rents. So if there's really some issue of price gouging, I'd like to know that it's real before we go forward with any sort of legislation just to make a show of it. Thanks, Neil. Let's go back to Lorian. And then Ryan hasn't spoken up yet either. So we'll do Lorian then Ryan, if Ryan wants to speak. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I believe this is not, uh, uh, this does not cover uh, commercial properties. This is just for residential property um, renters. And so this isn't something that we would want to normally insert ourselves into. But I think during this pandemic, we've had to bend and adjust in many different ways and adapt to our residents' needs, make budget decisions based on the pandemic in light of our residents' increasing needs. And with over 600,000 people applying for unemployment, um, you know, hundreds of thousands are still not able to access um, a consistent income stream. Um, I just think it's almost similar to the safety net services that we provided to our seniors when they requested rental assistance for a year. I think when we have the ability to make decisions um, during difficult times um, and we can assist our residents in need, um, some that come to us, some who um, go to the county and use their 311, um, some who are suffering in silence because they don't know that we can be a resource to them. I think it would just alleviate confusion and concerns that this is like the most basic thing people should not have to worry about food, clothing, and shelter. And so if we can, you know, uh, discuss or propose a potential uh, not imposing an increase for the next three to six months, I don't think this would um, push us to be controlling the rent or making any static changes that would be long-term changes. And so I would hope that um, we all understand that in times of need, we just have to bend and be flexible and think outside of the box for ways that we can help our residents. and. This was brought to us because the county has taken the lead on this um, and other municipalities are um, joining in and to alleviate confusion and 
bring peace of mind to some of our renters. Um, it would, um, I think it would just be helpful. That's all. Thank you, Lori Ann. Uh, we'll go to Ryan. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm conflicted about this because as has been said, this is an emergency, it's a crisis. Uh, the bottom has fallen out of the economy and I'm sympathetic to the struggles that I know a lot of people have right now. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, right now, uh, Maryland courts have already uh, stayed and paused all residential eviction proceedings that may otherwise have been started or finished uh, throughout the course of this emergency, uh, which has pushed back, uh, you know, any possibility for people to lose their housing if they're a renter, um, at least in the short term. And I'm not a fan of symbolic legislation that I don't really feel is going to actually respond to um, a specific data-driven need. Um, but uh, if there's a need based on facts um, and based on real cases of people coming to us uh, that is sufficient to justify further consideration of this, you know, I can understand why we would want to have that discussion and possibly uh, have that temporary legislation. I will note that as far as I know, no one has come to the city and requested this relief from us. Um, I understand from the very sort of preliminary bit of research that our staff has done, that there've been a handful of cases where over the last month or so, we've had inquiries either to our code enforcement uh, office or our landlord tenant commission, or even our community services division uh, with people having questions or maybe a couple of complaints about some proposed rent increases and that pretty much all of these were uh, informally resolved uh, and the resolution uh, either uh, ended up with a very, very minimal rent increase or no rent increase at all, either of which would have satisfied what the county's law and what the city of Rockville's law, uh, new law uh, says. Um, but I'm also sympathetic to the argument that Laurie Ann raised that there may be a lot of people out there who just don't know that they can come to us or don't have the opportunities or resources or um, you know, sophistication or familiarity with civic institutions to know who to ask uh, for that kind of assistance or to ask at all uh, or consider that that assistance might be available. Um, I do believe that we as a legislating body have the ability and the um, strength to be able to say that if we do something in the short term, that we're not going to do something uh, in the long term. And so I'm not as concerned about the slippery slope argument if we were to have some sort of emergency legislation that was temporary and six months or a year or five years from now, somebody came to us and said, we have to turn this into permanent rent control. I feel like at least I know I could distinguish between the two arguments and make separate determinations about whether a temporary measure makes sense versus permanent rent control. So I'm not too concerned about that argument, but I do understand it does open the door for further debate on it. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of on the fence about it, but I support the idea of having staff maybe do a deeper dive on research and consideration of what um, a draft uh, piece of legislation might look like if we decide we wanted to introduce it what would be the justification for it, what parameters we would put in it that might be different from uh, the county or the city of Rockville or others. And so my understanding of what Mike is asking for is that we're, we direct staff to do a deeper dive to kind of figure all this out and maybe make some recommendations to us uh, before we take any action. And I do support that uh, because as I've said, there are a number of questions here and concerns that I have about trying to do the right thing for people in need but at the same time, I don't want to just do this because everybody else is doing it without having a good understanding of, you know, what are the consequences? What is the actual need out there for a piece of legislation? Um, and, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm satisfied that the information gathered by staff and presented to us and in, you know, a, a respectful debate with my colleagues indicates that this is something we ought to do, um, then I'm open to it. Those are fair points, and, and frankly, I, I agree. I do, you know, I'm not 
going to say I, I, I'm not interested to hear from, from staff about the need for this and that I've, my mind's not closed to this. I just wanted to express my, my reticence and initial inclination. And uh, if, if there is a need, I'm certainly willing to, to entertain it. I saw Rob raising his hand. Rob Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I just wanted to share an idea that I talked with staff about and um, to start out there to see if I have research it. It's informed by my, my personal experience. So as some of you know, as mayor, you know, my, my kid attends Goddard School. You had a very warm reception. And so currently daycare is closed except for essential personnel. And so the state has closed them. Um, I qualify as an essential personnel and so does my wife. And so we access the daycare. Um, but along with the closure of the daycare, um, they also, the state has also, um, and allowing essential personnel to attend, the state has also said that essential personnel don't pay for daycare. And daycares cannot charge essential personnel for that daycare. And so, you know, a lot of people are suffering here, but some aren't. And so I'm still employed. Uh, my wife's still employed. And we have the ability to pay for daycare. But under the state's legislation, we can't pay for daycare. So they can't receive any money for us from us, um, which we would pay more than what the state is paying. So they're actually taking a revenue loss to allow our kids to attend daycare. Um, when we're in a situation where I would actually want to pay them the full full amount because I know how much they impact, are being impacted. And so what I suggested to staff is that, you know, instead of a, a across the board rent moratorium or rent cap for whatever duration of time, would it be legal to do some kind of legislation that would allow either the city manager or the commission on landlord tenant affairs to um, if a tenant can come in and show that they have lost their job or had some kind of income impact um, that w the commission or the city manager is, is empowered to cap the rent so there would the market forces would still be in place for those of us that can pay for things and it allows um, the landlords to then operate in contractual agreements with the people as they normally would. Um, but in situations where folks are impacted, that there is some kind of a remedy for situations where the tenants and the landlords can't come to an agreement on um, capping a rent increase, which I understand staff is saying right now, the handful of anecdotal cases, they are coming to that agreement, but it would give um, the city an additional tool in those cases where it, it doesn't, where that kind of comedy doesn't come to uh, fruition. Um, and I would think that for landlords, you know, it would be put them in a better situation where if they could, if markets dictate a rent increase for folks that can afford it, they would have increased revenue that would allow them to then address situations for those that can't afford it. Um, so I don't know if that's legal. I asked staff to look into it. It's, it's kind of a more surgical approach than an across the board moratorium or, or cap. Um, but it's kind of informed from my own experience that I'm going through with my children's daycare right now. Thank you, Rob. So um, Dennis and Lynn, let me ask you guys, you, you've seen what's on the table here. Um, obviously there's some interest in determining, uh, number one, what's, what are the facts on the ground? What's the need in the city? And then Lynn, from your perspective, you know, what are our legal parameters? Do you guys feel guided? I think we have enough information to provide some feedback back to the council. Um, just to clarify, we are talking about residential property only, um, and then to explore kind of what other communities have done, and then kind of Rob's idea of some other mechanism that might be um, less universal, but more specific to an individual's needs. Well, that was my intent was residential only. I was just going to ask you that, Mike. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Lynn? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Uh, certainly, as you all are aware, staff has already done some work on this issue. Um, so I think we can certainly come back to you with some recommendations uh, regarding uh, what type of ordinance and how it would be structured, as well as some basic information about what the need is. 
Fair enough. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you guys for the discussion. I'm going to finish up with my comments and then we'll go to uh, from the acting city manager. So um, I first off want to thank everybody for their comments and, and, uh, and good ideas here. Um, and then just turn it to, to the book festival. Um, I, I don't, if, if you hear anybody speaking about the book festival in past tense, please correct them. It is still going on, it's going on for the next four weeks. And, and in fact, this very weekend, we have, um, we have programs that I think a lot of people will be interested in. Friday night, uh, Lou Byard, who's a really amazing writer and researcher, he's written a historical fiction about Abraham Lincoln uh, called Courting Mr. Lincoln. It's about the courtship of Mary, Mary Todd and Abraham Lincoln. And it's, it's excellent. And it will be Friday, 5.30 PM on our TGIF live program. And then Saturday evening at seven, we have ABC News White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl, um, in conversation with uh, Susan Page from USA Today. And they're gonna be talking about Carl's book, Front Row at the Trump Show. Um, and that, that one's actually a pre-recorded, uh, which will premiere at seven o'clock on Saturday. We're expecting that both of the authors will be part of, will be in the chat room and uh, ready to interact and answer questions. Um, so you'll have a chance to, to, uh, to get to meet Jonathan Carl and, or e-meet, virtually meet Jonathan Carl and, and uh, Susan Page. And then on Sunday, uh, uh, Adam Gidwitz, the words for the, our kids program, Sunday Morning Kids at 11 a.m., Adam Gidwitz, who uh, writes for sort of young to middle grade um, and is supposed to be a, a terrific presenter, um, he'll be on for the kids. So anybody with kids that you know, please steer them toward that program. Um, and then the next three weeks after that, we have terrific programs. Just for everything you need, um, go to GaithersburgBookFestival.org. We're gonna tell you about our new YouTube channel and you can, you can um, subscribe to the channel and you can set yourself up for reminders so you don't miss anything. It's, it's going to be awesome. And I will, I'll wait for a couple of weeks before I get into my uh, enormous praise for staff and what they were able to, to turn around in basically 45 days, reinvent our festival. We'll get to that later. But for now, um, I'm just going to go to from the acting city manager, Dennis, go right ahead. Thanks, Mayor. Um, this week is National Public Works Week, and I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to thank all the Public Works employees who normally do a great job, but I think they've really risen to the challenges that face the city and the community um, over the last couple of months. Um, in addition, I wanted to kind of highlight, as you know, we've been working with a number of partners providing uh, community needs and services throughout this time. Uh, the city is highlighting a new program where we'll be working with the Seneca Creek Community Church on First Build Road um, to create a Gaithersburg Cares Hub. Uh, this would be a place where individuals could um, drop off uh, materials for um, health items, uh, food for children, families, and seniors, and then it would be used for those individuals who are recovering from COVID-19 at their home. You know, as we all know, one of the keys to keeping everybody else healthy in the community is making sure that those individuals who become infected stay home and have the services that they need. This would be an opportunity for those individuals to have those needed items delivered directly to their door. And so the city will be setting up a web page on how uh, residents can donate items, uh, also providing kind of an up-to-date list of those items that are in need and then how individuals can refer families for packages. And the Seneca Creek Church staff and the volunteers will be on their site uh, from nine to five uh, each weekday, uh, collecting those items, inventorying, and then packaging them for delivery. Um, they do, we will still need some volunteers, especially for the delivery side. And Maureen Herndon with our Community Services Division is the best person to kind of contact that. We'll be pushing more out as that program gets running um, later this week. In addition, um, just to clarify, I think most of the audience is aware that Montgomery County has extended the stay at home order. I just wanted to let everybody know that that order does apply to the residences and businesses of the city of Gaithersburg. And while we wait for to see a decline in the number of cases, 
I will let you know that the city is developing plans to open city facilities when the county determines it is safe to do so. Uh, we will continue to provide essential services at this time, and then we'll be looking to phase in additional operations as soon as it is safe. Uh, we will keep you posted on the details on our website and social media accounts. That's all I have for today. Thank you, Dennis. Um, appreciate all, all you and our staff are doing. Um, I forgot something to, that I needed to say, and Lorianne also did, so I'll just get mine out of the way, which is we do not have a work session next week. Uh, the next regular meeting of the Mayor and City Council is on June 1st. And Lorianne, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to um, thank staff, um, Britta, Monica, Louise, and Maureen for their assistance um, over the past couple of weeks. They've just been so responsive and provided me with so much information at the last minute and I was able to do a presentation for um, the National League of Cities and I just wanna just thank them for adapting and responding in this time of need in so many ways and being patient with us regardless of the request. So thank you to everyone. Mike. Mike, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, first thing about the uh, your virtual book festival. I wanted to extend compliments to uh, Phil Kaminsky, your virtual moderator. Did a great job and I expect he'll continue to do a great job uh, as the book festival continues virtually. So uh, kudos to him. And then uh, to get back to the issue that, that uh, Dennis brought up, you know, we had a, a distribution on Friday at Boer Park. It was certainly, I think there was a real demonstration of, of the the dire need of many families in the area. Uh, there were over a thousand people that were served uh, with uh, uh, that were able to pick up, uh, you know, some important staples to, to feed their families. And there were people that uh, were not that, that were not able to uh, obtain that uh, those supplies because uh, they ran out. So I'm glad to see that we're moving. Uh, to expand our efforts here, uh, and I urge people to, uh, to volunteer uh, to help. Uh, we have particular need in the 20877 and 20878 zip codes within the city uh, for families that, that uh, need this kind of uh, assistance. So uh, whether you contribute uh, dollars or materials, uh, products, or whether you uh, contribute your own time to these efforts, could be greatly appreciated not only by uh, the city but also by those people who are going to benefit from the, the opportunity here so uh, i think we're all going to try and tap our networks to to round up those volunteers so thanks again for that staff for for taking this on uh, one of the organizations that that's collaborating is also the kentland community foundation they they are tapping their volunteer networks as well so thanks Thank you, Mike. Um, next uh, tech team, if you could bring up Tom Lonergan and, for our economic development update. Welcome, Tom. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, very quickly, over the weekend, the U.S. Small Business Administration did release some much needed guidance for small business owners on how to qualify for loan forgiveness under the Paycheck protection program. The low interest forgivable loans have been attractive to small businesses, but owners have had a lot of questions about how to ensure they won't have to repay the loan. Uh, the PPP, which is uh, part of the Coronavirus Act uh, Relief and the Co Economic Security Act, was designated as a lifeline to small businesses, but it does focus on getting employees back on the payrolls. The money must be used over a certain period of time on things like payroll, rent, and utilities, businesses must hire back employees to qualify for forgiveness too. For the first time this weekend, the SBA, which oversees the program, released a form that businesses will have to file in order to apply for loan forgiveness. The form comes with detailed instructions and worksheets for calculating forgiveness, uh, similar to what you'd see in other government forms, including payroll tax forms. Tom, uh, while the f yes? Can you um, send us a link to, to this so we can help distribute this info? Will do. I didn't mean uh, to cut you off either. I, no, I no. just wanted to make sure we, I got that in because I want the link. Nope, I'll send it to you today. 
uh, it doesn't answer every uh, question business owners might ask, but it is a start. Uh, and the SBA has promised to release more guidance to borrowers and lenders uh, very soon. Uh, visit sba.gov for more information. Of course, I will forward the, the link to all of you um, and any other information you might have about the PPP program, which is actually still accepting applications. And very briefly, non-COVID related, I did want to just quickly note that uh, Therry and Waddell, a commercial construction firm that has long been located here in Gaithersburg at 100 Lake Forest Boulevard, has relocated their offices to 820 West Diamond Avenue, the same address as Adventist Health's headquarters. Uh, TW had been in the market for new office space for some time, and we're obviously thrilled that this company has recommitted to Gaithersburg for several more years, if not entirely unsurprised that they did that. Um, they've occupied around 8,000 uh, square feet of new space, uh, and the associated improvements were supported by a toolbox grant from the city. And we just want to welcome back Jerry and his team to the city. They've been great neighbors for a long time. That's all I got. Thank you, Tom. That is excellent news. Um, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Tech team, if we could bring in Anthony Berger, uh, we will move on to ordinances, resolutions, and regulations and talk about a resolution for uh, to authorize this acting city manager to, to renew contracts uh, for engineering services uh, for capital infrastructure projects. Anthony, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this item I is located. Johnson too. Sorry about that. Go this ahead. This item I'm is sorry. located. Sure. This item is located on uh, pages 13 through 16 of your packet. The Engineering Services Division is requesting a resolution authorizing the acting city manager to renew the contract for engineering services. Originally executed in 2018, the resolution before you is the final option year of this contract. The Engineering Services Division has been successfully using this contract, providing project delivery on capital improvement projects, as well as accomplishing important ongoing engineering tasks like routine inspection of our culverts, bridges, and high mass lighting. This contract also provides expertise that support our day-to-day -day operations for things like uh, retaining wall reviews uh, as part of the development review process or traffic studies uh, that are necessary whenever evaluating resident requests for traffic calming measures. Having the contract in place allows the city to accomplish engineering tasks quickly by utilizing a pool of pre-qualified consultants organized into nine subcategories of work. Because the contract uses utilizes uh, pre-qualified consultants, the city benefits from a shortened RFP process, which includes a component of competition uh, by having two consultants bid against each other on task force. This year, the contract is estimated at $519,800, uh, with funding com coming from a combination of operating funds and capital improvement funds, all proposed in the fiscal year 2021 budget. This contract will expire April 30th, 2021. I appreciate your consideration of this request, and it would be my pleasure to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Um, council members, raise your hand if you have a question or comment. Neil. So uh, looking through the list of vendors and projects that are part of this project program, um, I see that letter A, streets improvement, is about bicycle, uh, bicycle pedestrian facilities design. Um, you know, we've had several projects come through on this contract and so far they've all been very expensive and difficult to, to move forward on. Are we still using the same consultants for future projects and do we have some reason to expect that the work is actually gonna be able to uh, be utilized by the city? We do still have the same pool of consultants available to us um, under renewal of this contract, uh, but we do also have the option to um, put those particular projects out for separate RFP for, for exactly the reasons that you've stated. Yeah, I think my position would be in that case, I'd wanna, I'd suggest, I mean, it's your, you're the staff, so I'm just, my, my input is that in those particular projects, um, I think we need to either give better direction to these particular vendors or think about vendors that can come up with a more creative, cost-effective, and less disruptive approach to doing these sorts of projects in an existing uh, city in our existing infrastructure.
Any other questions or comments? And if not, would someone like to move the resolution? Councilmember Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Move approval. Neil? I'll second the motion. Okay, we're gonna call the roll. All in favor, please say aye. Um, any opposed say nay. Uh, Councilmember Harris. Aye. Councilmember Sesma. Aye. Councilmember Sales. Aye. Councilmember Spiegel. Aye. Councilmember Wu. Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Thank you all very much. Uh, Mike Johnson, you are staying with us. Um, Good evening, um, Mayor and members of Council. Um, the resolution uh, before you this evening is a resolution that authorizes the Mayor and City Council to authorize the acting city manager to enter into contract for the purchase of a gymnasium partition replacement for the activity center at Boer Park. Um, the partition uh, separates the two gymnasiums, um, gym, named gymnasium number one and two, and uh, it, it was, is original to the building. It was installed um, around 1988. And over the years, uh, we've, uh, Public Works has been spending um, more man hours um, dealing with maintenance issues, and then fairly recently, we're beginning to pick up operational issues, the difficulty with moving and actually opening or closing that uh, partition. Um, in performing an inspection on the condition, it's felt that it is at the end of its use useful life. And money uh, was budgeted in the capital improvement program for its replacement. Um, we were able to use the Montgomery County Public Schools contract 9018-7, um, which um, is, can be used expressly for that. And um, the firm Modern Door and Equipment Sales from White Plains, Maryland, was um, the um, firm that was decided to be used. And their price for doing the work was $180,857, which was less than the budgeted amount of $185,000. Uh, we feel that uh, given the, the great use that this um, an amenity that this, these gymnasiums provide to city residents, that this would be a um, prudent and timely um, CIP project and ask that you approve it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, council members, raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. If not, raise your hand if you'd like to move the resolution. We'll go with council member Sesma. Uh, just a quick question. Have we, uh, we've got have good evidence of the firm's work uh, in this area, installing these kinds of uh, partitions? Yes, we do. They, they are in, actually in the second year of doing work for Montgomery County Public Schools, and um, their work is quite outstanding. They're one of the leading firms in this particular um, content area. Great. So uh, with that, uh, I'll move the resolution. I saw Lorraine's hand. Second. Okay, we're gonna call the roll. All those in favor say aye, any opposed say nay. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Sesma. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Carries unanimously. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next. You're still with us, Mike. You got a bunch of items. This is, um, well, I'll let you introduce it. Go right ahead. Um, I believe, uh, tech team, could you bring up Mark uh, Scafidi? I think he was um, supposed to do this one. Oh, maybe it was Sean Stevens. Oh, Sean Stevens, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. The resolution before you tonight is to authorize the acting city manager to enter into a contract for the purchase of one 2020 or current production year cabin chassis, knuckle boom trash loader, and two trailers. Unit number 3430, a 2005 Chevrolet boom truck, and units 6615 and 6616, both 2005 Peterson dump trailers, have reached the end of their useful service life. Due to their age, condition, and reliability, these vehicles and equipment were scheduled for replacement in the FY20 budget. 
On February 28, 2020, the city issued RFP 2020-020 for sealed bill proposals for the purchase of this vehicle and equipment. On April 17, 2020, the city received two sealed bids for these units. Staff recommends award to the lowest responsive bidder, Infrastructure Solutions Group Incorporated, in the amount of $223,672. Once the new units arrive, the old units will be sold at public Public question, do you have any questions for me? Council members, raise, uh, raise your hand if you have a question or comment on this. Council member Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Sean. Um, so the, the two bids, it, that's a um, extremely tight shot group there. What, um, what was our independent estimate of the um, Amount. We had predicted, we, we bought a new set of boom trucks and trailers at last year, and they came in approximately $5,000 less. We, for, we expected about a 5% increase. We've been seeing across the board all this year with all of our vehicle replacement, it seems to be about a 5 to 10% increases for various reasons. I, I'm, it's cost be, being passed on, I think, due to cost of steel earlier, than, earlier in the year and everything else. But we've been seeing a pretty... All the increases on all the vehicles we've replaced this year have been pretty consistent. Okay, thanks. I'll move the resolution, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I'm not seeing Council Member Sesma. Um, so, but we, Lorian, did you mean to second it? Second, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, did we lose Council Member Sesma? Is anybody seeing him on your screen? I, I accidentally uh, moved Council Member Council Member Sesma to attendee status. I apologize, uh, sir. <laughs> Demoted the Dean of our Council. Okay, uh, we, have a, we have a motion in a second. Um, and I'm gonna call the roll. All those in favor say aye, any opposed say nay. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Council Member Sesma. Yes, I did manage to hear all of that and I support it, I. Okay, excellent. We will move on to the next agenda item, which I think is also Sean Stevens. Um, Sean, take it away. This resolution before you tonight is to authorize the acting city manager to enter into a contract for the purchase of two single axle dump trucks with snow plows and tailgate spreaders and one forestry body truck. Unit 3923, a 2007 Chevrolet single axle dump truck, Unit 3617, a 2009 International Dump Truck, and Unit 2550, a 2007 Chevrolet Forestry Body Truck, have all reached the end of their useful service life. Due to their age, condition, and reliability, these vehicles were scheduled for replacement in the FY20 budget. On February 28, 2020, the city issued RFP 2020-020 for sealed bid proposals for the purchase of two single axle dump trucks, with snow plows and tailgate spreaders and one forestry body truck. On April 17, 2020, the city received one sealed bid for these units. Staff recommends award to the lowest responsive bidder, K Needle International Trucks Incorporated in the amount of $399,125. Once the new units arrive, the old units will be sold at public auction. Do you have any questions for me concerning this resolution? Just uh, a question about the, whether it was a surprise to you that we only got one bid on this. I was surprised. Part of me was surprised and part of me wasn't. Um, the dump trucks last year were all awarded to Neal International also. And it just seems that right now the international trucks are the cheaper trucks on the market. So I just, we had the bid out on the street for over 30 days and we just didn't receive any more bids. So I, don't know if it's other bidders just don't want to compete. Maybe they know the international, they can't compete with the internationals right now. I'm not really sure. Okay. Uh, Lorian. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a quick question because I, I, we, the city of Gaithersburg during the um, winter games with the city of Rockville, we won those winter games, correct? We and did we not did. win last year. We lost to Rockville last year. Oh, okay. Thanks okay. for opening up that wound. 
two years. Why did you bring that up, Morgan? Why did you bring that up? Come on. Because I wanted to know, do we really need new equipment? Well, it looks like we may need some new equipment. I know we didn't. <laughs> I know we didn't have a, a bad winter last year. I wasn't sure. So thank you for the clarification. Were any of these vehicles used during the uh, challenge we had last year? These were not used during the challenge. Generally during the challenge, we use our newer vehicles. Okay. These, tru these trucks are some of our oldest in the fleet right now, and they're, they're older than what we usually replace them at right now. Okay, and this is something that you're anticipating that we will need, because I know, I don't know what the usage was last winter. Yes, if we believe if Mother Nature gets back to normal, we will need these trucks again in the future. Okay, all right. Neil. Just on the, along those lines, are these trucks only used in the winter or are they used for things all the rest of the year as well? No, sir. These trucks are used year round for, okay. for leaf collection, for snow removal. We use them for bulk pickup at times when things are very ha heavy. We use them during, you know, special storm events, you know, storm damage and along those lines. We use them throughout the year. Rob Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Sean, same question. What was our independent estimate of the amount? We, again, the increase from last year to this year was approximately 5% from what we paid last year, and it was in line with what we were thinking. Council Member Wu, with that, or do I see Mike? Mike, are you trying to say something? Move it. I was just going to move it, move the resolution. Okay. So we'll Second. Okay, uh, I'll call the roll. Uh, Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Council Member Sesma. Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Sean, Mark, appreciate it. Thank you. Next tech team, if you could bring up Tom Lonergan, and um, I believe we have Robert Goldman and Artie Harris from MHP here as well. I'm, I'm not, they don't have a formal, I don't think they have a formal presentation, but if we have any questions, then we have Louise Kaufman. Um, Tom, I'll let you take it away. Uh, no, welcome actually, everybody. I think I'm gonna let Louise take it away. Louise, and welcome yes. everybody. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. The resolution before you tonight would authorize the acting city manager to terminate the existing loan documents with MHP for 425 and 439 North Frederick Avenue and to enter into new loan documents under the same terms and conditions. This um, packet begins on page 122. It contains a memorandum um, to the council detailing the project scope, the financing, and some background on MHP in the city. Um, there's also a letter in the packet from Vice President of Real Estate, Artie Harris, requesting the loan extension and the resolution for your consideration. Um, Montgomery Housing Partnership has made a request for a two-year extension of the two loans issued by the city in 2012 and 2013. Pursuant to those loan agreements, MHP was to repay the principal balance of $736,000 in January 2020, plus any unpaid interest. Um, the interest is current through June 2020, um, but the outstanding loan of 736,000 has not been paid. Although the city is supportive of the request, staff wishes to ensure that the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development financing package is approved prior to December 31st, 2020. Therefore, we are proposing a two-step approval process. Provide a short-term extension through December 2020, and should state financing be secured by that date, the city will extend the loan and interest due payments until December 31st, 2021. MHP intends to undertake significant renovations to the two properties, which would include new mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, as well as upgrades to the existing 78 
units, including significant um, electrical, uh, HVAC electrical updates. Um, although NHP contemplates construction of a new building at the site to pro provide some additional units, community space and management office, parking requirements and environmental constraints will dictate the size of the billing, building and any available services. The rehabilitation will be financed through low income housing tax credits, tax exempt bonds, state rental housing works, subordinate financing, county loans and MHP funds. Supportive, staff is supportive of the request and is seeking a vote on the resolution before you this evening. Um, so as I said, um, the Vice President of Real Estate, Artie Harris, and Robert Goldman, the President of MHP, are also here tonight to answer any questions. Um, before, we, before we get to council questions, I just wanna, if Artie or Robert, if you, if you wanted to add anything to Louise's background here or, or not, just, it's optional, but I wanna give you a chance. Um. Well, I appreciate that. I just, uh, I don't have a lot to add. Louise covered uh, pretty well, uh, but just want to thank Louise and Tom for all their uh, help and support uh, uh, over the last few years, uh, and as well as the support of the council and the mayor. Um, just, you know, it's all, it's all in the packet, but MHP is a nonprofit, mission-oriented organization, been around for 30 years. Uh, we own over 2,166 2100, 2, units. Uh, we, this is the work we do. We bought this property, it was in, you know, fairly, uh, had a certain amount of deferred maintenance and we've been work, work to uh, improve the property. But our ultimate goal here, as we've talked about, is to uh, do a much more substantial renovation, try to get some community uh, space and other things. Our mission, not just housing, but it's about empowering the families that live there. So far we've uh, did a community garden and then created some playground area for the with the residents, but we'd like to do uh, much more. Um, and so I think there's a lot of potential here, um, but to get to the final uh, point uh, w with um, the work we wanna do, it needs an extension um, uh, for two years. So uh, we appreciate uh, uh, your support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Spiegel. Thank you. Uh, I think this has been a good investment and I think MHP has been uh, a good partner, but I just had a couple of technical questions. First, my understanding is that uh, our resolution uh, is uh, conditional upon uh, the approval of state financing uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, I'm just a little confused about the timeline for uh, state financing because in the background materials, uh, the redevelopment timeline indicated that uh, the application for the state's low income housing tax credit, which I understand is essentially a buy right application and we're very confident that MHP will get, um, that that application would be um, in the spring, basically now, uh, and that the closing on that financing wouldn't occur potentially till summer of 2021. Now, there's a line in the redevelopment timeline in the background materials called viability commitment submission, uh, which is scheduled for fall 2020. I assume that means that that's the time when the state will indicate uh, that it accepts the application, even if it's not formally finally closing on the financing. But I just, I wanted to get an understanding of that because I wanna make sure that we don't have an unintended consequence here where by the nature of our condition, uh, MHP doesn't get stuck in a situation where technically they haven't formally received uh, the uh, low income housing tax credit from the state by December 31st of 2020. Yeah, I want to let Artie uh, speak yes. to sort of the timeline and the process the state has. Yes, yeah, so the state has a two part process. First, you submit your application, which we will by June, and they have typically around 90 days to to determine if you pass threshold, right? And the 4% credits are by right. So if you pass threshold, which is a low bar, and you have to have like 100 points of 200, then, then you are uh, awarded the right to, to the credits. And so I think that's how Luis and set it up so that by the fall, we would know that we passed threshold. And then you, because you have to have about 35% of your construction documents 
or schematic documents. And then once you pass threshold, then you do the final documents and then do the final, final underwriting. But once you pass threshold, you are, you are, have the right to 4% credit. So that's why they set it up so that by December, uh, we would know, we would know in the late fall if we were past threshold. So we're very confident that we will. And that's why we, uh, they, they set it up as a two-part process. Great. And so I would assume that our staff and yours would draft any final documents for the new rollover loan to make it clear that that's the, that's the condition, that it's not the condition that would come after 2020 so that we don't get into any kind of legal jam there. But uh, thank you for that answer. That, that helps clarify it for me. And then this is a kind of a pie in the sky question. So I don't mean to put you guys on the spot, but I'm just curious. Uh, you know, the grand plans to purchase 431 uh, North Frederick and have an assembled parcel uh, didn't happen. That certainly wasn't uh, through any fault of MHP or the city. Um, I'm just curious and feel free to tell me that you're not allowed to share this with me if it's some sort of proprietary strategic information, but are you guys still sort of keeping your eyes open to see what happens with 431 or have we kind of moved too far beyond uh, that option at this point with the investments and the plans for the other two properties. And I'm so glad you asked that question because that, that was on my mind too. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, that was our, you know, that was our dream and that's really what our goal really was in the beginning. This is why we sort of need this extension is that we were going down one path and now we need to go down a second, a totally different path. Um, and I, you know, I generally say, you, you know, you never say never, but at this point, I think we're, you know, the price was too high. Um, and unless something miraculous happened uh, in a very short period of time, we're kind of going down this path. Uh, and it would, you know, it would be sort of a much longer term uh, option. Um, so um, at this point, uh, I don't see it as something that we would be uh, pursuing. Okay, thank you. Those are all the questions I had. Appreciate your partnership. Yep, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? If I don't see any, then maybe someone wants to move the resolution. Ryan. I will move the resolution, Mr. Mayor. Mike. Mike, you're muted. Uh, my cursor keeps moving. Uh, second. Okay. Um, all in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Um, Councilmember Harris. Aye. Councilmember Sales. Aye. Councilmember Spiegel. Aye. Councilmember Wu. Aye. Councilmember Sesma. Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Yep, thank you all very thank much. Thank you very much. Good thank luck you. with the process. Um, we will move on to staff guidance, and if we can bring um, John Schlichting up as well as Kevin Rogers for this discussion about um, extend, extending the agreement with WRS on um, Lake Forest Mall. Welcome, John. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, at your August 19th 2019 meeting, the mayor and council agreed to defer action on a proposed moratorium for 150 days to allow Lake Forest Retail Investment LLC, repped by WRS, uh, and the city to work on a development agreement to allow the property commonly known as Lake Forest Mall to be developed with the best possible mix, density, and configuration of uses. The agreement to defer was entered into on September 20th, and the development agreement was executed um, on December 4th. Both agreements expired on February 18th. At your February 18th meeting, the mayor and city council agreed to a 90-day extension of both agreements, and the new agreements were entered into on February 21st. Both agreements are set to expire on Thursday of this week. Given their inability to secure financing to purchase the four anchor properties during the COVID-19 public health crisis, Lake Forest has requested an additional 90-day extension. If the mayor and city council is inclined to agree to another extension, 
Staff recommends that you authorize the acting city manager to negotiate and execute a new agreement and a new de development agreement upon the same terms and conditions as the September 20th and December 4th agreements. With the exception of extending the time period for Lake Forest to acquire the four anchor properties by 90 days. Kevin Rogers of WRS is here to comment and Tom Lonergan and Rob Robinson uh, and I are here to answer questions. Thanks, John. Um, you know, if I was to go by the, the council uh, statements in February on this, I would, I would have expected, anticipated that this meeting would be a lot of holding feet to fire. Um, but obviously, uh, some things have happened in the world that have changed uh, the equation on everything. And so, um, I look, Kevin Rogers, well, welcome. Um, I want to give you a chance to uh, speak on behalf of WRS. Uh, Mayor, thank you. I <clears throat> Earlier when we were testing this, I, I evidently had a, a dodgy connection, so I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, again, appreciate the opportunity. As I told John and Tom on the telephone two weeks ago, and I think I told all of you in an email, as I stood before you in February, we would be... <clears throat> all of us staring at the circumstances that we are. You told me clearly, all of you told me clearly, you didn't want to see us back there asking for more time. I told you we didn't want it back there asking for more time. Um, <clears throat> to say a curveball has been thrown at us is, is an understatement, <clears throat> but as recently as today, I spoke with uh, probably one of the more prominent taking up a lot of the headlines in the newspaper, J.C. Penney. They filed bankruptcy. They have a procedure for disposing of their real estate. They actually have a special procedure for disposing of their um, non-income producing assets, such as their closed store at Gaithersburg. So they're putting me in touch with their um, court-appointed um, disposition group. And... Uh, um, and so have maintained all those conversations with all of the anchors during this difficult time of, of securing the financing that's necessary, which, which candidly for, for a while was, was um, available, was unavailable and it was a scary time in terms of that project. And it was a scary time for all of us with, with many things, but um, for that project. So thanks for even considering it. I, this is not a place I would once Kevin, we are topic. Kevin, we are getting some hiccups with you, but I think I think we've got gotten enough to where okay. we we know we've gotten the gist of this. Okay. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to council members who who want who want to either uh, add any specific guidance or um, this this is staff guidance. Lynn, do we would we need a? I guess we would need a motion on this. So either uh, to provide comment or to make a motion. Uh, just raise your hand, council members. Let's go with Neil first. So um, I, again, as as you were saying, uh, we never anticipated in February that we would be uh, here in COVID land at this point. And uh, I think for all of us, this, this is challenging for you. It's got to be unbelievably challenging given the situation in retail. So uh, given the unanticipated circumstances. I'm very supportive of giving you some extra time uh, and I wish you the best of luck because this is still a project we'd love to see moving forward, but uh, uh, the challenges keep getting greater for you. So I don't know how, I don't know how much farther we go down the road with this given the, the current circumstances, but you'll fill us in as we, uh, as we continue to talk. Well, the numbers. Uh, Mike, let's go to Mike. Uh, I'm inclined to uh, agree with Neil's position on going forward. I do, uh, I do want to emphasize that I don't know. I don't think we can continue to to hold hold off on our own uh, planning and visioning for this site uh, much longer than another extension. But uh, I guess that all remains to be seen. But I would support it this time 
but I think uh, we have to think about our own uh, uh, our, our own uh, position with regard to this this location, this site, and and what it would mean to the city. And I think that we're just going to have to, uh, at some point, we're going to have to bite the bullet and and move forward with with uh, developing those plans and that vision and, and engaging the community and what that might be. So uh, hopefully the developer will be there to come along with us. But I think that that's, so right now, uh, I will support it. Okay, Rob Wu. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, nothing more, nothing much more to add to what Mike and, and Neil said. You know, just to, to the extent that, you know, all of us have kind of put a pause in our life due to the situation. Um, I, I would support um, you know, a, a pause here for at least a little while in the short term. Um, hopefully see results, but kind of as Mike said, you know, this can't be the status quo for over the long term. Thank you, Rob. Does someone, uh, Ryan, please. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really conflicted about this one, um, not because of anything uh, the WRS has done in recent weeks, but um, just because I'm concerned that the situation in the world may make it far less likely rather than more likely uh, that we'd be able to get a deal done. But I want to hold out hope and I, I want to be fair to WRS in the sense that this is certainly not anybody's fault here that the bottom fell out from the economy and the world changed so dramatically in the last couple of months. So um, I think given that, uh, I think the mayor was right that if we've been sitting here in February, we might be singing a different tune. And I certainly did sing a different tune last time, uh, but I want to acknowledge, you know, in, in fairness uh, that, you know, none of us saw this coming and you should have an opportunity at least for one extension to try to address it and do what you can uh, but with the bankruptcies uh, of some of the anchors uh, and with the state of the economy, um, you know, I, I, I'm rooting for you, but I am not optimistic that this is going to be able to be pulled off in the next 90 days. And I agree with my colleagues that this is not something that we can just continue to renew over and over again, even, even under these incredible and unprecedented circumstances. So I'll support this one extension. Um, only because, you know, the, the, the world has completely changed in, in an unexpected way. And I think it's only fair to you. Uh, but um, I'm getting the sense that my colleagues are, are going to agree with me that when we come back in 90 days, if we haven't really uh, had much to show for it, um, you know, it's going to be difficult to, to be able to justify uh, any additional extension as we need to move forward with our process. Uh, one way or the other. And I think you understand that as well, Kevin. So uh, certainly, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do right by the process, but also try to acknowledge the realities of the world. And so I'm going to support one, one more extension. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion? Lorianne. Mayor, I'd like to move the approval to extend the agreement with WRS for an additional 90 days for Lake Forest Mall. Neil. I second the motion. Okay, then we're gonna call the roll. Uh, uh, all in favor say aye, all opposed say nay. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Council Member Sesma. Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Uh, Kevin, thank you for being with us and, and we're wishing you luck. And that, um, with that, do we do we have anything from any other staff? Um, and I can see if somebody, oh, Lynn, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have two items tonight. Uh, one, I wanted to let the mayor and council know that the circuit court held a three and a half hour virtual hearing today in the Johnson et al. versus the city of Gaithersburg case, which is the Wawa administrative appeal. Um, Judge Cho has indicated that she will issue her ruling uh, via another virtual meeting on next Tuesday at 1.30. So we'll certainly keep you updated uh, once we get the judge's ruling in that case. Um, the second item is our outside telecom council has let us know that um, 
The FCC has decided that it will consider additional rulemaking on the small cell issue, our favorite, one of our favorite topics, um, at their June 9th meeting. Um, this was based on uh, additional requests that we received from the telecom uh, folks a couple months ago. They are uh, pushing, or the chair of the FCC is pushing what they're calling a 5G fast track. Um, so if the FCC does move forward with this at the June 9th meeting, it's likely there would be proposed rulemaking with a comment period and that they would come back uh, probably sometime in the fall to adopt these regulations. Uh, but at least what our understanding of what the FCC is likely to propose would further limit and restrict local authority in this particular area. So we'll certainly follow this issue as well. And um, you know, if there is a comment period, we will certainly uh, work to make com uh, public comments. Um, and we would also coordinate with uh, both you know, MML, NLC, um, all of the uh, local government organizations to make our voices heard. Thank you very much for keeping us on top of uh, both matters, Lynn. Uh, we you. appreciate it. Anything from any other staff? And I'm, I'm sort of looking over at the participants list. And if I see a raised hand, then I can, I can call on somebody. Other than that, um, I'm not seeing anything from anybody, so I'm assuming we're good here. Um, a reminder, we do not have a work session next week. The next regular meeting of the Mayor Council is on Monday, June 1st. And uh, please check out GaithersburgBookFestival.org for programming this weekend and next weekend that you're guaranteed to like. Uh, we appreciate everyone's participation and support. And until next time, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned. <laughs>